So Andy, why should someone care about the center in Brussels? Well, the center creates an opportunity for our customers to get real visibility into our products. Uh, and that kind of transparency is something that hopefully will spread across the industry as uh, government and customers have a objective and transparent basis for knowing you know, which products are worthy of trust. So a center like this helps encourage transparency and helps raise the bar for assurance. You mentioned governments. How will uh, not only governments but citizens and other vendors be able to benefit from what goes on here? Well, there will be direct study of the products by customers and by their third-party experts. Uh, and that gives a high level of assurance that the products do not have issues that the customers or governments or consumers need to be concerned about. Andy, what are some of the specific threats that this center will focus on? And then uh, are those threats unique to Huawei? Well, there are threats in cyberspace. There are sophisticated, resourced, malicious actors who intend to do harm of individuals or organizations. Uh, so the threats are that products could have significant vulnerabilities that could be exploited by malicious actors of all different skill levels. In addition, there's the risk of insiders planning malicious code or hidden functionality. Uh, so it's the ability to know whether or not there's significant vulnerabilities and to know whether there's hidden functionality within the products. That's what the testing of the products can help give an assurance level to customers and stakeholders. So Andy, you talked about the verification and testing at the center uh, for, for Huawei products, but are these threats specific to Huawei or are they really apply to all vendors and supply chains across the communications network? The threats from malicious actors in cyberspace that may want to take advantage of hidden vulnerabilities or hidden functionality in products is a threat that applies to all vendors and all products. The experts in government and the private sector recognize that there is cyber supply chain risk everywhere and that it's important to address the risk relative to all vendors. Andy, um, Huawei has been operating a testing center in China for some time. How will the uh, testing that goes on here compare and contrast to that center and other centers? Well, we have an independent cybersecurity laboratory uh, in, at our headquarters in China. And there we do testing of products before they actually leave Huawei. This new center in Brussels is sort of an extension of that cybersecurity lab, giving customers the ability to go to a much closer location so it's much easier to come and to test the products. The information that's obtained can be shared with the center, uh, but it doesn't have to be. Let me, let me, uh, let me expand on that. So the, the center in Brussels is in effect an extension of our internal cybersecurity lab in China. Previously, customers could go to China and do the kinds of testing they wanted to, with, regardless of what tools they wanted to bring or bring third-party experts. Now they can bring those tools, they can bring those experts to Huawei and Brussels to have the products examined in a much more convenient location. So Andy, describe, in, in your opinion, a global governance framework that would provide um, governments and citizens the security, cybersecurity, uh, monitoring, and transparency that's going to be required on an ongoing basis. Well, with the growing importance of information and communication technologies to our lives and, and to our organizations, it's becoming increasingly obvious that we need to have objective and transparent means for customers, stakeholders, and citizens to know which products are worthy of trust. So it's very important to develop a framework, an assurance framework that can apply to the global supply chain and to all products. So it's important for governments and private companies to work together to try to figure out what kinds of mechanisms, such as testing of products by independent third parties, could be set in place on a regional basis, perhaps, so the products could be tested once and could be used everywhere. In addition, a global assurance framework needs to try to help the buyers of information and communication technologies develop risk-informed procurement requirements to help incentivize the makers of these products. In addition, it would be great if, if customers and governments would work with the information and communication technology providers to have the industry develop their own statements of what the assurance and transparency requirements are that they will live by. That in turn will help encourage the providers to raise the bar. And that's what we have to do is hopefully by market-based incentives, we can raise the bar so that we have more secure products and services. 
So whose role is it? Is it a standards body, a uh, global standards body to develop this framework? And if so, what are some examples of the, the standards bodies that would take the lead on this uh, project? Well, one of the challenges and the beauties of cyberspace is that nobody's in charge. So that what has developed is a very uh, robust system of internationally recognized standards, not just for security, but for quality and, and functionality. And so as we move toward 5G Internet of Things world, we see that these standards efforts, particularly GSMA uh, and 3GPP, are developing very robust standards. And then uh, individual governments and customers can try to hold those products uh, to prove that they, they comply with those standards. So it's a continuous effort to improve the ability to have assurance and transparency uh, as we move forward. One of the things that we have to keep in mind about these products that are used in information and communication technologies in the major communication sectors of the world is these products aren't run by the vendors. These products are run by the carriers. And the carriers have very strong requirements, best practices and standards they, fo they follow to monitor their own networks, to look for anomalous incoming traffic, outbound traffic, and internal traffic. They have the ability to segment their networks so that if there is a problem, they can minimize the damage to the operation of their networks, which promotes risk mitigation, and it also promotes resilience. So we have to remember that it's a, it's a relationship between the carriers and the providers with great visibility by the standards bodies uh, and by the government stakeholders. Andy, thanks for your time. You're welcome.